thank you so much for, for joining me uh, on today's uh, brunch. So let's go straight into the things that I want to talk about. And firstly, I want to talk about uh, the elections in Northern Ireland, and that's really relevant because the Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. There were some things that came up in the agent update, which was recently released, so I want to go through those. Then I want to look at the things that affect payroll or could affect payroll that came out of the Queen's speech, which was, was, was read by the Prince of Wales, uh, Prince Charles. Then I want to talk about something that was issued yesterday to software developers uh, regarding the increase to the primary threshold from July, the national insurance primary threshold. And then I want to try and engage with uh, uh, members of the uh, uh, brunch, or join us to the brunch, about the review that I'm currently going through with the Level 3 Payroll Administrator Apprenticeship. Okay, okay, let's have a look and let's start with Northern Ireland. And I, I really, people think, oh, are you Northern Irish? And I'm not Northern Irish, but I think it's so important that we consider Northern Ireland if we are to be truly called UK payroll and reward professionals. So we had the elections at the, the beginning of May, different in Northern Ireland than they were in Great Britain because they were voting for uh, members of the executive or members of the legislative assembly, which then makes up the executive. So 90 seats and there are, there are the results. And it came out that the, the, the leading party was Sinn Féin and, uh, Sinn Féin, and the, leading Demo uh, the leading unionist party was the Democratic Unionist Party. However, still, um, we have not got a uh, government, a, a functioning government in Northern Ireland, and it's all to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and largely, it's the Democratic Unionist Party that have said, uh, we will not elect a speaker. And without a speaker in the uh, legisl Legislative Assembly, um, no functioning can, can go on. So I just thought it was interesting to have a look at the number of uh, people in the parties or the number of uh, 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 members of the Legislative Assembly that were for the Northern Ireland Protocol and those that were against the Northern Ireland Protocol. And you can see that, that out of the 90, there's quite a clear majority of those that actually favour the protocol in place at the moment over those that are against it. And yet you've still got one party that is blocking the formation of a government. And that does matter because of the number of things that are devolved to, to Northern Ireland. Also, what's interesting is a report that came out recently which recommended that um, Northern Ireland gets income tax sharing powers, uh, so revenue generating powers by 2027. So possibly for the 2027, 28 tax year. Will that happen? I don't know. It just makes sense. Wales has got revenue generating powers. It's got devolved taxes, like Wales has got devolved taxes. It's got shared taxes and income taxes are shared tax. So Wales shares its income tax with the, the United Kingdom government in London. And it makes sense that Northern Ireland follows that. How will it actually work? Well, the, the report that came out recommended that the sharing in Northern Ireland for Northern Irish taxpayers, presumably, would follow that loosely um, of what happens in either Wales or um, Scotland. So I think that's one to keep an eye on. But of course, without a government, we haven't got a programme for government. And it will be interesting to see once a government or an executive in Northern Ireland is formed, whether or not that forms part of the, their programme for government. So going for income tax sharing. Inc uh, the agent update, I think, was really interesting. Um, issue 96. Um, just on a few points, so I've, I've, when you get a copy of the slides, uh, you'll see the link there, uh, if you haven't seen issue 96 of the agent update, and there was one section on there, it's about tell, telling HMRC on the FPS about a new employee, and it says if you get um, uh, um, a P45 
after a checklist has been received and submitted to HMRC, what they're saying now and making clear to employers is do not update the tax code or with the tax code or any pay and tax details from a previous employment, only use the P45 to update the payroll system with student loan information. I, yes, I have a student loan. No, I don't have a student loan. And if they do have a student loan, well, which student loan do you have? Do you have plan one? Do you have plan two, et cetera? So I thought that was quite interesting clears up um, a, a lot of questions about a P45 being received after the first FPS has actually been submitted to HMRC that contained a starter checklist and the declaration. And it talked about student and postgraduate loans specifically with regards to off payroll workers. And it clarified, and this is not new information, but it clarified that off payroll workers um, are not subject to student loan deductions. So if somebody is truly an off payroll worker, you should not be making a student loan deduction. And then it talked about the off payroll worker marker. And it said that uh, there's some employers, uh, uh, according to their research, that are using the off payroll worker marker incorrectly. So the off payroll worker marker should only be used when somebody is on the payroll and they're an off payroll worker, one of these IR35 uh, workers. And what they're saying is, um, if the employer and an employer uses the off payroll worker marker for somebody that isn't an off payroll worker, what that does at HMRC is it prevents the student loan deduction that's probably made correctly. It prevents that deduction passing over to the student loans company. So that's something to watch for. Look in your software for, for the position of the off payroll worker marker and only flag that for truly off payroll workers. And it talks about start and stop notifications, again, with, with regard to student and postgraduate loans. And it says that start notices are being sent out, but not, not always are employers updating their records because the employer is saying, well, they don't earn enough to have a student loan deduction. So what the agent update said well, was um, update the employee's record regardless of whether or not they're going to actually physically pay a student or a postgraduate loan. And then it said about the stop notice. Again, it's, this is not in new information. It's just clarification information by HMRC. And it said, when a stop notice is, is received, you cease deductions from the next available payday. So that's not new information, just clarification. And then, interesting, it said that there's going to be changes to their um, uh, employer helpline process. So going forward, uh, you'll only be able to um, ask questions and get specific answers to your PAYE scheme if you quote your PAYE reference number or your accounts office reference number. If you don't quote those, you'll only get generic advice. So they'll, they'll say, well, I can't give you specific advice because you haven't actually identified who you are and which PAYE scheme you're talking for about. And then it said also, um, and this is specifically for agents and bookkeepers, maybe in bureaus, um, do not use your client's login details to try and log into their account. Use the agent services account. I know that it's not exactly the same information that's displayed on the client's um, um, uh, portal, um, but they are saying don't use client's login details. So I would have a look at the agent update um, from May. Now, last month, I talked about well, what we could possibly expect from the Queen's speech. Now we know what the Queen's speech was all about. So that Her Majesty was not there. It was read by the Prince of, uh, Prince of Wales from the throne in the, the House of Lords. And I think what was, oh, and I've just, I've just said that. And yes, it absolutely, the Queen's speech, so we'll keep calling it the Queen's speech, Queen's speech opened this new parliamentary session. So what happens at the start of the new parliamentary session is anything in the last parliamentary session falls away. So if there was a bill going through that's not specifically carried forward into the next parliamentary session, 
it falls away. And there were many bills that fell away. I wrote an article, which is on the I Re Realize website, um, uh, because there were 38 bills. And uh, so I've got a link there to the article that I wrote. And the 38 bills are made up of bills that were carried over from the previous parliamentary session to the new parliamentary session. There were bills that were uh, uh, that they said well, we would introduce them in the last parliamentary session or the parliamentary session before, but they weren't introduced. So they're included in the 38. And there's bills that are known as foreshadowed bills. And this is bills where possibly somebody on the television has said, well, we're going to legislate for that. Or possibly a policy announcement has come out and said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. So that there's, there's been some speculation um, or foreshadowing in the past that this bill would happen or this legislation would happen. And then if it wasn't carried over, if it wasn't a bill that was uh, uh, not introduced, but is reintroduced or a foreshadowed bill, it's a new bill. So there was 38 in total. Now, when you look at the bills, what you really have to do is look at the commentary that goes with the Queen's speech, which uh, there's a link to in the article that I wrote on the I Realise website, because not all of the bills apply UK wide. Some of them only apply to Great Britain. Some of them are specific to Northern Ireland, and some of them are specific to England only because we've always got to remember that Wales has got its own legislative making assembly. So has um, uh, Northern Ireland, so has Scotland. So you need to look at all of these bills, especially the ones that are employment related. If they're employment related, they can't relate to national insure, uh, to uh, Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland can do what it likes with regards to employment law. So some are UK wide, some are Great Britain, some apply to Northern Ireland only, and some are England only. So uh, really exciting day looking at the, the Queen's speech and the contents of, this, of the Queen's speech. But the, what was glaringly omitted from the Queen's speech was this employment bill. Now, when the, the, the current government came into power in 2019, the Queen said, uh, we will introduce an employment bill. Now, the employment bill was set to introduce some measures that were in the, the good work plan. Um, and I'm sure that you'll be familiar with the, uh, the good work plan, which is years old now. It was, set, it was also set to introduce carers leave. So a statutory entitlement for carers to take time away from the workplace. It was going to extend the shared parental leave and pay regime, introduce a new statutory entitlement in Great Britain for neonatal leave and pay, enhanced maternity protections. We've talked about that for years, or that's been on the bubbling away as consultations and responses for years. That's what the employment bill was supposed to um, introduce and make flexible working the default in um, uh, new employments or existing employments, but it wasn't there. It wasn't introduced um, um, in, in, in 2019, in 2020, 21, 22. It has not been introduced. And, and I just said, well, where the, has the flipping thing gone? Because it was set to introduce some real employment, good employment rights that it had promised uh, and were promised in the uh, Conservative Party manifesto from 2019. So where has it gone? But despite the fact that the employment bill was missing, there's been a couple of announcements. Um, the first announcement was extending the ban that currently exists on exclusivity clauses in um, contracts of employment in Great Britain. It can only apply to Great Britain because they cannot um, uh, set employment law for Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland um, can set its own. So exclusivity clauses are already banned in zero hour contracts. And an exclusivity clause is basically you will not work for anybody else. You will only work for me. So it's already banned in zero hours contracts. Now they're talking about extending that ban on exclusivity clauses to people earning at or below the lower earnings limit. And there was a press release came out on the 9th of May, and I've put a link to that press release there. And that's something that we've got to watch for. 
Then there was this future of work review that was announced, or at least the terms of reference were announced. And the terms of reference said this person, and I can't remember the person's name off the top of my head, Matt, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, will be leading this future of work, work review, which will look at existing government commitments, including those proposed by Matthew Taylor, and he talked about UK-wide um, um, employment law reforms. It cannot be UK-wide. It must be great. Uh, it must be Great Britain. So I think we need to look out um, for this future of work review and which of the existing government commitments, including those proposed by Matthew Taylor, he actually decides to, to pick up on and propose, because that's what the terms of reference say, um, pick up on some and propose, make recommendations of how we can proceed. While we're talking about announcements, it's worth also saying about this maintaining the momentum review from 2017. And the 2017 review was maintaining the momentum of auto enrollment. Auto enrollment is going great. This is what the review said. Auto enrollment is going great. We've got a load of people saving for their retirement, many more people saving for their retirement than were previously saving for their retirement. And this is absolutely great. This is what we want to do. How can we, we maintain that momentum? That's what the review was all about. And it said, well, we can, um, uh, get more people into enrol or auto enrolment, paying more into their pension funds if we remove the lower qualifying earnings band. So in a lot of pension scheme, pension contributions start to be paid once um, earnings go above the lower qualifying earnings band, which used to be linked to the lower earnings limit. So um, and uh, 120 pounds, I think, 120 pounds it is still at the moment. So the link between the lower earnings limits has been broken. So we can get more people paying uh, uh, more money if we remove that lower qualifying earnings band. So pension uh, contributions are paid from pound one by the worker and by the employee. And how we can also get more people in, so we can get more money in, by removing the lower qualifying earnings band, we can get more money and more people into the auto enrollment uh, regime by reducing the enrollment age, the eligible worker enrollment age from 22 to 18. And the, the maintaining the momentum review said, this should happen by the mid 2020s. Well, mid 2020s, what are we talking about there? 24, 25, something like that. We need to know about this now or very, very soon, because this is not something that can be done, done overnight uh, by employers who are going to have to change their policies and procedures and they're going to have to communicate. Software is going to have to be developed as well. So a lot of uh, uh, differing views. The pensions minister, Guy Opperman, said one thing at a committee. The Department of Work and Pensions said another thing at the committee. But Guy Opperman, the pensions minister, actually tweeted on the 28th of April, it will happen, i.e. those two things, removing the lower queb and uh, reducing the enrolment age from 22 to 18, by the mid 2020s will happen. So I think we need to look for that. So going on to the things that were in the Queen's speech and the things that we should be looking out for. Um, firstly, it's the data reform bill. And that's really interesting. And I don't think it's any secret that there's going to be reforms to the um, uh, UK General Data Protection Regulation, uh, GDPR. And GDPR was a U uh, an EU initiative, which the UK was forced to um, uh, adopt because we were members of the European Union at the time. They want to reform that. They want to make a clearer regulatory environment. However, the thing to watch for is the changes that they make, which will result in a revised or a new Data Protection Act. So we've got the Data Protection Act 2018. Um, so there'll be either revisions to that or a new Data Protection Act. What we've got to make sure is uh, to, to allow the free flow of data specifically into and out of the European Union, that the new framework they're um, uh, proposing 
conforms to the existing adequacy agreement that the UK have got with the European Union. So that's something to watch for. Higher education bill as well is something to watch for. It talks about implementing this post-18 reforms in England, although the bill will extend to England and Wales. Now, what will happen in England is that to be eligible for a student loan, to be legislated for by the higher education bill, to be eligible for a student loan in the first place, the person must be educated to a certain standard, must have certain qualifications. From September 2023, to ensure that the student in England taking out the loan, repays more of their loan, they're going to extend the repayment period, and they're going to decrease the repayment threshold. So you, the, the current uh, threshold, 20 odd thousand pounds, is going to be reduced. Extending the repayment period, decreasing the repayment threshold, will mean that these people going in from the academic year starting in September 2023 will pay more of their loan for longer. And then, they're introducing this lifelong learning um, uh, uh, loan. So everybody will be entitled to a lifelong learning loan to be used throughout their, throughout their lifetime for various, for various learning. So we've got to watch um, for that. Now, I don't understand really why this higher education bill says that it will extend to England and Wales because a lot of the things this post-18 reform review was about education in England. The minimum qualification requirements will apply to students in England. The only thing that I can think um, uh, why it will extend to Wales as well is that if Wales don't intervene and do something, um, via their own legislation, the extensions to the repayment period and the decrease of the repayment threshold will also apply to Welsh borrowers as well. So I think we need to look for this higher education bill anyway, and what Wales are going to do if they don't want to follow um, what England are doing for its students. What else to look for? We've got... Yes, that, well, this was one of the foreshadowed bills because Grant Shapps, the, the current transport secretary in England, definitely said that the, the, the P&O um, saga, um, we're, we're actually going to do something. We're going to make sure that seafarers are paid the national minimum wage. That, that is what he said um, on various, uh, various news networks. Well, the consultation that came out on this Harbour Seafarers Remuneration Bill says it will uh, uh, be effective when parliamentary time allows. Well, it's been introduced in this parliamentary session. You would hope that parliamentary time would allow it in this uh, parliamentary session, or maybe it would be carried forward to the next parliamentary session. What was interesting, if you read the consultation about the bill, and they talk about payment of the national minimum wage, they're talking about not the actual national minimum wage, they're talking about a national minimum wage equivalent for that's, that's to be paid by ferry operators who dock at UK ports. So it's not the national minimum wage, it's the national minimum, minimum wage equivalent. And one of the things that the um, consultation asks is, well, how do we calculate this national minimum wage equivalent? The difference for um, um, employers is that HMRC will not enforce this national minimum wage equivalent. It will be enforced by another body. So it's not the national minimum wage, it's the national minimum wage equivalent. So we've got a new initialism to get used to, NMW and a small E. The Brexit Freedoms Bill, now I wonder what this Brexit Freedoms Bill is going to do, to be quite honest. It's actually going to give ministers the power to ch easily change 
the um, European Union laws that were adopted into domestic legis legislation after the UK left the European Union and the end of the transition period. So that's one thing. And then it will uh, look at the retained EU law, but downgrade its status, which means that, and, and that's quite important because the status currently says, well, the, the, the governing body, if, if you like, is the European Courts of Justice. Um, or European Union Courts of Justice. So they'll downgrade the status so that the governing law will be within the United Kingdom, presumably the Supreme Court. But this government have not been uh, backward in saying there are benefits of Brexit. Um, and uh, the, the link that I've got there talks about the, the paper benefits of breakfast, uh, bre breakfast. <laughs> benefits of Brexit uh, uh, talks about how the UK can and should take advantage of leaving the European Union and there's things that can be done to cut the red tape that was imposed by European Union laws and minimizing burdens that were again were imposed by European U Union laws which the UK was bound to adopt being a, un a, a European Union member. So I think that is really an interesting bill to watch, but it's the powers that are imposed later under that bill, which will be more interesting to watch. So what powers will be used and what things will be changed? I can't imagine things will be, so the bill will go through in this parliamentary session, but I can't imagine that the powers um, gain from the bill will be used to change legislation before there's another general election. I can't imagine, I can't imagine anyway. And then this procurement bill as well, does it really affect um, uh, payroll and reward? Well, simply what it's going to do is it's going to make bidding for public sector contracts easier. And um, Ian, can you remember the acronyms here? It's going to change the bidding process from the most economically advantageous tender to the most advantageous tender. So it's taken out the word economic, which means that for public sector contracts, it will be easier for small and medium employers to uh, put in a tender because that word economic is taken out. But this won't apply to Scotland because they're going to do their own thing. So it's just England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And apart from that, the Queen's speech was not very exciting, uh, to be quite honest. And I was expecting a lot from the Queen's speech, particularly that employment bill. Bearing in mind that the Queen's speech, this parliamentary session now, it's probably the last parliamentary session where the government can actually introduce laws and do something with those laws before the next general election, which is po probably, and who am I to uh, guess, probably going to be May 2024. Uh, and that's what the Conservative Party in, indeed have said. They're going to, there's going to be a two year run up to the uh, general election starting in May 2022. So from that statement, I've I've uh, 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 believed that the next general election is going to be May 2024. So it's going to take a while for this legislation to get through in this parliamentary session, and then for things to happen as a result of that legislation. So this is the last real legislative opportunity the current government has. Something came out yesterday. Um, from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs about the increase to the national insurance primary threshold in July. <coughs> and the spring statement announced a, a, a large increase to the value of the primary threshold for paydays from the 6th of July up to and including the 5th of April 2023. So all of the other thresholds stay the same, so your lower earnings limit, your secondary threshold, your free, uh, your free ports, your upper um, uh, earnings limit, your apprentice, all of those stay the same. The only thing that is changing is the primary threshold and the primary threshold is the point at which the employee starts to pay national insurance. That's got nothing to do with employer's national insurance. It's the point at which the employee starts to pay national insurance. 
what HMRC's announcement to, to software developers said yesterday, it reinforced that this is only for payments made on the 6th of April or after the 6th of April. So if you pay on the 5th of April, it's the old primary threshold or the current primary threshold. If you pay on the 6th of April, 6th of July, if you pay on the 5th of July, it's the current primary threshold. If you pay on or after the 6th of July, it's the new primary threshold. So what they were saying is, if you run your payroll early and you're paying on or after the 6th of July, just check when you run an early payroll that your software provider has updated their software. And then it's also said for, for users of PAYE basic tools, so HMRC's, only, uh, HMRC's own uh, 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 payroll product, that is going to be updated on the 4th of July. And then there was a comment in there. So if you use basic PAYE tools to, to run your payroll, wait until after the 4th of July, 2022. It'd be interesting to see if that, because it's, it's, it's used for uh, uh, very small, employ small employers, up to nine employees. So it'd be interesting um, if, if that has uh, uh, an implication. So if you do use it, uh, maybe you just use it to, 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 to run a few employees on, be aware that it's not being updated until the 4th of July. So that was the announcement that came out yesterday. <clears throat> now I want to talk about the review that I'm currently going through, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of the level three payroll administrator apprenticeship. Um, and I've been talking about it in various places, and this is an ideal place to talk about it again, because I just want to make sure that as wide a population as possible is aware of what I'm doing and the, um, and the, the trailblazer. Now, apprentices are available UK-wide, so Scotland has its own apprenticeship regime because it's a devolved policy, so does Wales, so does Northern Ireland. But the apprenticeship that I'm looking at, which is the Level 3 Payroll Administrator, only applies if the employee works at least 50% of their time in England. So here I am, sitting in Wales, uh, uh, writing a payroll apprenticeship for employees, and apprentices are employees that work 50% or more of their time in England. So this one does apply in that instance. So if, if you're not in, the, uh, uh, in England or your employee does not work 50% or more of their time in England, you're gonna have to look for another payroll apprenticeship. I don't know if one exists in Wales. I don't think it does. In Scotland, there is one that exists, but it's going to be phased out later on this year and merged with another one. And I cannot tell you what happens in Northern Ireland. So this really is the only valid um, um, uh, payroll, uh, payroll apprenticeship around at the moment. And what we need to be doing is, is getting out of our heads, our, our old fashioned perhaps, thinking of what an apprentice actually is, a young person sitting with an older person learning the job. It's not necessarily young people. Apprenticeships in England and the regime in England means that any age of employee can become an apprentice. So it's good for new employees going into the profession for the first time. But if somebody's been in the profession for a long time, but maybe they haven't got a recognised qualification, they can get that recognised qualification by going through an apprenticeship. And that's the question that I'm always asked. Is, that a, is, is this apprenticeship a relevant qualification? Um, because it doesn't perhaps look like a relevant uh, qualification. I've seen others advertised. My response right from the very beginning, this is when I first started advertising that I was doing this back in 2018, my response has always been, I think it's the professional qualification because unlike other professional qualifications, this has actually been written and built by the members of the profession, specifically for the payroll profession. Other qualifications possibly have not been written with industry engagement. Maybe they've been written by an organization who believes that it's right for the profession. But the apprenticeship qualification 
payroll, and indeed any apprenticeship qualification has been written by a trailblazer who are in the profession and they've written it for the profession. So that makes it different from a commercial qualification. Secondly, it outlines a number of knowledge statements. And the knowledge statement is things that the trailblazer thinks that the apprentice must know. You must know how to calculate tax. You must know about statutory sick pay. You must know about the apprenticeship levy, that kind of thing. Then it outlines a number of skills that the apprentice must have. So a skill is really, well, you must know, you must know your payroll system at your, at your workplace, but the skill would be, it's fine knowing it, but you must be able to use it. So you've got to uh, know that you've got to calculate income tax, but the skill is you've got to actually be able to do it. And then it outlines a number of behaviours. And the behaviours are the things that um, inherently, we are, as, as payroll people, we, we have. So we must be honest and we must be ethical and we must wear um, uh, pink ties on a Thursday and we must wear socks with the days of the week on it and we must be religious and all that kind of whatever. The, the behaviours that are um, um, inherent in a good payroll administrator. Now, the payroll administrator apprenticeship has the knowledges, skills and behaviours or KSBs has those documented. They're not always documented um, in commercial qualifications. So because it's a recognised qualification, um, I believe that job descriptions um, should actually say, rather than asking for a specific qualification from a specific organisation, a job description maybe should maybe should say um, somebody qualified at level three, for example, the payroll administrator apprenticeship, uh, a curriculum vitae when you send that in. So it, as well as saying, well, I've got this qualification from this particular body, the payroll administrator apprenticeship is a recognised qualification. So if you've got it, advertise it. If you want somebody qualified, advertise that on your job description. So with regards to the engagement that I've been doing so far, um, I'm the trailblazer chair for the level three and the level five. And uh, people think, oh, it's very grand. And um, Ian Holloway writes the thing all on his own. That's absolutely untrue. I sit in the middle of a group of people uh, with this grand, grand title for this administratively burdensome um, uh, amount of work that, uh, in, involved in putting together this apprenticeship. Because what I do is I send emails to members of the trail, what's called a trailblazer. So what I've done around me, because I don't know everything, around me, um, I've uh, uh, accumulated uh, big employers, small employers, um, uh, public sector employers, private construction industry scheme, um, uh, from uh, employers from as many different professions as possible. And I've got bookkeepers on there as well, agents on there as well, bureaus on there as well. So I'm getting as many different opinions as possible. So what happens in payroll in the private sector is not necessarily the same as what happens in the public sector. And what happens at a bookkeeping environment is totally different again. So there's me in the middle coordinating the views of all of these people that are members of the payroll profession. And what I also do is I talk to my relationship manager at the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical, Technical Education. So she will come to me as the trailblazer chair and she said, well, what does the trailblazer group think? And I will say, well, I've done a survey or I've corresponded or I've spoken to members of the profession and this is their view. So the, the relationship that I have with my relationship manager is really, really important. And what I also do is I make sure that I talk to apprenticeship training providers. Uh, so apprenticeship training providers are the people that deliver the apprenticeship. And that's a totally new thing for me in 2022 and 2021 when I was doing it, because I didn't have the benefit of talking to people that were actually delivering the apprenticeship or assessing the apprenticeship back in 2018. So it was 
almost flying blind, I suppose. But now I've got three, at least three years worth of experience. So I talk to apprenticeship training providers. What do you find difficult? What do you find easy? What's irrelevant? What's really relevant? What would you like to see made better? That kind of thing. So I get the views of my relationship manager who will say to me, you can do this. You can't do that. You've got to do it this way. You've got to put this in capital letters. You've got to put a comma after this. So there's, there's certain rules that I've got to go by, but I go to apprenticeship training providers as well and the trailblazer. So the trailblazer might think one thing. I'll go to the relationship manager and she's, she's, she might say, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Or I say, well, yeah, OK, how can we how can we make that work? But it has to work for apprenticeship training providers and endpoint assessment organisations. So I committed to review the apprenticeship um, in uh, 2018 when it was uh, made live. And there's two parts to the uh, payroll administrator apprenticeship, indeed any apprenticeship, and that's the standard. So the standard is basically, this is what the job is. These are the uh, role specifics, and these are the knowledges, skills, and behaviors. And that's absolutely essential that we get that right, because the knowledge, skills and behaviours that are in that feed through to the endpoint assessment plan, which is the second part of the apprenticeship. So I committed to review the standard after a maximum of three years or when there was a requirement uh, needed because there'd been a significant change. So I committed to do that and I am doing that. And in um, 2018, when we originally put the standards together, we quoted two bodies that aligned their, said they would align their, their uh, professional membership criteria to the apprenticeship. So I only quoted two bodies, um, maybe at the time should not have quoted any bodies, because in actual fact, there are many professional bodies out there. So to only quote two was putting those other bodies, um, sort of like almost saying, well, those other bodies don't exist. And I had a lot of feedback from ATPs, from apprenticeship training providers and employers that were saying, well, the, the apprenticeship standard in 2018, the original one, only quoted these two bodies. And what I've got is employers come in to me and employers express this as well. Um, employers come in and saying, well, why would I go with a, a particular training provider? Because they're not, not getting their training material provided by one of the two bodies quoted on the apprenticeship, which was absolutely true and, and didn't realize the commercial implications of, of quoting two bodies. So after engaging with the trailblazer, after engaging with the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education and the profession, the standard has now taken those two bodies off. And it specifically says there are a number of prof professional bodies in the payroll profession. So the Institute has not singled out any individual body for mention on the standard. So that was quite an achievement uh, to do that, reflective of the fact that, that is, that's what the industry wanted. But the bigger review is the review that I'm doing now. And it is a review. I'm not rewriting the role of the payroll administrator. I'm not rewriting it, nor is the trailblazer. The Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education are not rewriting the role because the role hasn't fundamentally changed. There is still a requirement for a payroll administrator. So it's a review of the standard and a review of the endpoint assessment plan. So it's time that it was done and I've been engaging, engaging and engaging, and that's what I'm doing here. With the goals that the review that I'm doing for both the occupational standard and the endpoint assessment plan will be appropriate for the payroll profession. It will be robust. So that's particularly the training and particularly the endpoint assessment process will be robust. Um, so we don't want to just let anybody um, uh, get this qualification. There has to be robust assessment. They have to actually prove that they can do these, the, these things, these knowledges, skills and behaviours. So appropriate and robust. 
but coupled with that, I have to make sure that it's deliverable. There's no point having the most appropriate thing in the world and the mo most robust uh, uh, assessment methods if apprenticeship training providers come to me and enterprise assessment organizations come to me and say, it's so flipping hard, we can't deliver that. So what's appropriate and what's robust has to be balanced by the fact that it's deliverable. And what's appropriate has to be uh, uh, leveled with the fact that this is a level three qualification. Possibly there were things in the previous apprenticeship that were above level three. So it's the occupational standard that I'm looking at at the moment. And as I've said before, that's the most important thing that I want to get done. And I've put together an engagement survey and I've, I, I've done a webinar for I Realize and I've done webinars. I've done other webinars talking about this engagement survey and I'll put a link to this engagement survey as well because I want your opinion I've got the trailblazers opinion I've got the institute for apprenticeships opinion the apprenticeship training providers the ones that talk to me they've given me opinions now I want the wider um, opinion and it's about well where is the occupation found bookkeeping agent payroll bureau that kind of thing what is the rough purpose of the job. So I just have to put this, uh, the, the occupation is found here, it's found there, it's found there. The broadly, the purpose of the profession is this, and roughly in their daily work, they'll do this, 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 and they'll collaborate with this person and this person and this person. Then I have to look at the job titles. Now, the job titles in the original standard were not necessarily reflective particularly of the agent environment and the bookkeeping environment, because we have to recognize that a payroll administrator might not always be known in an organization as a payroll administrator. So the trailblazer and I have come up with alter suggested alternative names, definitely including bookkeeper, definitely including agent and bureau, and we need to put in the word reward as well, because we are a reward um, uh, profession. And then a new thing that I've got to specify in the uh, standard is the duties of a payroll administrator. And after the apprenticeship is finished, the progression routes for a payroll administrator. Now, what I was very keen to do is make sure that the duties reflected the learning outcomes and the wording that was in the apprenticeship as it exists now, because the role of the apprentice, the payroll administrator apprentice has not changed. So the duties are effectively be aware of who your customers are, be aware of your business, you get information in, you create payroll records, you, you uh, put it into the payroll system and process the payroll. But you've got to be compliant with legislation, you've got to be compliant with what your organisation wants. Plus, you've got to communicate here, you've got to communicate there, you've got to work with your teams, you've got to be professional, and all the time you've got to be continuing to professionally and personally develop. So that's no different than what was in the original standard. The progression route is different. So we have to look at what is an appropriate progression route after the, the person has finished the level three. So obviously the, the natural progression is the assistant manager level five. And I've suggested that possibly somebody might go on to, oh, do you know, I fancy a bit of HR. I'll go on to an HR apprenticeship. Oh, do you know, I really like the pensions bit. I'll do a workplace pensions one. Or I like the tax bit. I'll do a tax one. So I'm consulting all the time on whether or not those are the relevant um, uh, apprenticeships after completion of the level three. And somebody or two people actually have made a really interesting comment that the um, level three payroll administrator apprenticeship does not cover employment law um, in the detail that would perhaps be required for somebody to go on to a level five HR apprenticeship. So I think what we'll actually have to do is convert level five to a level three. And that is all the purpose of the engagement that I'm doing. Now, when it comes to the knowledges, skills and behaviors, um, which is very, very important for me to, to, to get right and for the trailblazer to get right. I have not fundamentally changed the knowledges. The knowledges that are required 
in 2022 are exactly the same as 2018. Although there have been a couple of changes, for example, we've got the health and social care levy coming in from next year, as far as we know. But experience has taught us that maybe the pensions for payroll bit was a little bit too detailed for level three. So what we've done, the trailblazer agreed, my, the Institute for Apprenticeships agreed, and apprenticeship training providers agreed. Well, we've narrowed that down to the things that would be encountered by somebody at this level. We've looked at the, the, the standard said, payroll related legislation. Well, there's no such thing as payroll related legislation. You've got tax legislation, you've got social security legislation, but there's a lot of it. So what we've done, and there's a lot of it, so there's a lot to teach and there's a lot to possibly assess. So what we've done is we've narrowed down that legislation saying you will know this, you will know that. We've, um, uh, yes, some of the knowledge statements maybe weren't specific about what should be known. For example, the construction industry and gender pay gap reporting, things that should the, 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 the level three should be aware of, but not in depth, because this is level three. So we've been specific about what is covered um, under the construction industry scheme and what should be covered under gender pay gap reporting. With regards to the manual calculation, we've made sure that the focus is going to be on the employment status employee rather than any other employment status. Other employment statuses do exist, but the focus is going to be on, on the employee. With regards to calculating statutory leave, the main things that are uh, applicable and employers say they want at this level is statutory sick pay and statutory maternity pay. I've been amazed at how many ways I've seen income tax calculated. So we've been specific to say income tax will be calculated, taught and assessed via uh, uh, using the pay adjustment tables and the taxable pay tables. And you won't be assessed on all national insurance category letters, just national insurance category letters A and H. You'll have to know the others. But the manual calculation will only assess on A and H. The others will be assessed via another um, assessment method. And I'll just quickly whip through this because this is largely um, unchanged. The skills of a payroll administrator and the behaviours of a payroll administrator. And the only addition to the behaviours is a green behaviour, which is a requirement from the Institute for Apprenticeships. They want to encourage green working. And um, what the, the only thing that's applicable for level three is to perhaps respect the fact that climate change is happening, uh, there are ways of recycling, that kind of thing. And we've given an example, perhaps you can get rid of paper by promoting the use of online pay slips. So people shouldn't be worried that the skills have changed. They haven't, the behaviours have not changed. There's just a green behaviour on them. So what I really want is, oh, well, that's okay. That's what I'm, that's what I'm uh, um, consulting on at the moment. And then I will move on to the endpoint assessment plan. But it's absolutely essential that I get the standard right because it will feed through to the endpoint assessment plan. Now, the assessment methods for the current apprenticeship are the, currently the ones shown there, the multiple choice questions, the role simulation and the professional discussion. So some KSB is assessed by the multiple choice, some by the role simulation, some by that professional discussion. However, we're going to change that based on uh, developments based on experience, based on apprenticeship training providers and apprentices, we're going to change the role simulation to be a project. So rather than have a fictional organisation that says, Betty does this, she works 10 hours, she's on tax code so-and-so, national insurance category, let us see, calculate her net pay. We're not going to do that, we're going to make it a work-based related project um, that's completed at the workplace on things that they're familiar with on the, on the workplace. Multiple choice largely stay the same, professional discussion largely stay the same. So that's what I want your opinions on. And I've put together this survey, nine questions, 10 if you actually tell me who you are. Um, and I'm gonna keep that open until the end of the month, by which time I have to get rid of okay, go, uh, uh, feedback to the Institute for Apprenticeships to say I've engaged 
and as a result of engagement, uh, these are the changes that, that I've got to make. So please do take the survey. Any problems come to me or grab me on LinkedIn. And definitely, I'm not rewriting the profession, I'm reviewing it. Now, next month, I'm aware that uh, it is coming up next month, I'm gonna be joined by Matt Jenkin from Moorcrofts, who's the partner and head of employment there. And he is going to talk on a number of subjects specific, specifically regarding holiday pay. And it's really interesting, the interaction of holiday pay with sickness. So when, when, when you're sick, uh, can you take holiday and sick at the same time? I suppose that's really what I'm saying. Um, recent case law, which has changed holiday pay and leave. And what I would also be interested in is, are there any other things that you'd like Matt to talk about with regards to holiday pay? The interaction with sickness, I think is really interesting. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now and let Rick come in with the, the questions that might've been posed. But I've just quickly gone through the Northern Ireland elections, not political, just factual. Agent update, read that. Queen's speech, five bills to look out for. Be aware, 6th of July is the national insurance primary threshold. And please engage with me regarding this um, apprenticeship, because in that way, I can be sure that it's a payroll qualification built by the profession for the profession. Rick, I'm sorry, I've chatted for so long. All right, good morning. Um, we've got a few questions, actually. We've only got a couple of minutes, so we'll go through some quick ones. Um, are you engaging with all the organisations that are currently delivering the apprenticeship? The there's no requirement for me to engage, but it's good that I engage. And I do engage with the ones that are willing to engage with me. And there are some that do engage with me. Okay. Um, will there be a, I think so. Um, will there be a level seven payroll apprenticeship after you've done the review on level three? Well, I've done three. I've done five. If I don't do seven, it leaves no progression from five. Um, it's very, very administratively bur burdensome. It's time consuming, but I think to not do a seven at some point would be um, irresponsible. So yeah, at some point there'll be a progression route from five to seven, yes. Okay, going back to an earlier question. Um, when you say that Northern Ireland could get income tax powers by 27, will this be along the same lines as Scotland and Wales? Yes, because the report, um, and maybe I'll put a link to the, to the report. The report suggested um, either the, the flexibility to change rates, which applies in Wales, they've got the flexibility to change rates, or the flexibility to change rates and bans, and that applies in Scotland. So you would hope that if Northern Ireland do get sharing powers, that it's very closely linked to either Wales or Scotland. So it's not something totally new. But do remember it's sharing of income tax. It's not dev devolution of income tax, it's a sharing. So hopefully it'll be the same as Wales or Scotland. And it needs to come, it needs to come. Oh yes, and also the report recommended the devolution of the apprenticeship levy. Now that will be interesting as well. The devolution of the apprenticeship levy to Northern Ireland. Don't know how that will work. Okay. Um, another one's come in. Do you think that all hope of an employment, all hopes of an employment bill have gone? There, I think bits and pieces of it will come about. Possibly it will come in the next parliamentary session, but that will be too late for things to be introduced before a general election. But all of the things that were promised in the employment bill, which was announced in 2019, were Conservative Party manifesto commitments. So if the current prime minister is, is one that says we want to deliver on um, uh, our manifesto commitments, I think it's got to be introduced. But things have happened since 2019 that perhaps were not foreseen in 2019. But I think, I think it needs to come in some shape or form. I really, I really do. Okay, um, one more. Uh, will there be a new student loan type in payrolls as a result of the higher education bill? There has to be. There, there ab absolutely has to be. And I think HMRC are talking about this already. Um, it's going to be a planned five. Um, and that 
so, so the changes are going to be from the academic year starting in September 2023. So it won't be in payroll until the earliest uh, 2024. But that would, would not generally be people that are repaying their loan because it's generally repayable if you drop out of the course from the following April or the following April after you've finished the course. So the earliest, I think it would be 2024, but they will have to be, they will have to be. And that's, that's what's interesting. So they, they're gonna have to split plan two between uh, 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 students in England that uh, uh, were before September 2023 20, uh, and those after September 2023 will be on plan five. And if that, well, that's what we've got to look for, plan five, because Wales could be dragged into an English regime if they don't set up their own. But yes, they'll have to be a new plan. Very good. Well, that's that's everything. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to wrap up. I've got nothing. I've got nothing else to say. Please engage with me. So please, when the, when the slides are sent out, please follow that link. It's just nine questions, and I really can be sure, and I can demonstrate to the Institute for Apprenticeships and Department of Education that I'm coming out to the profession and I'm engaging with the profession, just so that we can be sure that this is a, a, an apprenticeship built for the profession by members of the profession. And I think what Matt has to say next uh, next month will be really interesting as well. The interaction between holiday pay and sickness and reviewing holiday pay case, recent case law. So if you've got anything that else you want covered, uh, do stick it in chat or send me an email or uh, grab me on LinkedIn. And then I can say to, to Matt what well, people would really like this covered. Oh, now I probably need a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs>